God. It has been printed in many languages. This is the English Bible, the King James Version. This is the Spanish Bible, and here we find the Italian Bible. This is the Russian Bible. How can we know that it is the Word of God? It is by prophecy. If the Bible can tell us the past, the present, and the future with unerring accuracy, then we may know it is the true Word of God. It also unveils the mysteries hidden from the minds of men. In our study, we will examine the ancient cultures and discover some clues that will help us to understand our topic on flying saucers and winged serpents. Let us consider the mystery of the UFO phenomena. Could the Bible possibly give us some clues on what or who is behind the UFO movement? Let us explore this fascinating subject. Flying saucers and winged serpents. The sea is mentioned a number of times in the Bible. Waters represent peoples and nations and multitudes and tongues. In the prophetic books of the Bible, we read of strange beasts. A lion with eagle wings coming up out of the sea represents the ancient kingdom of Babylon. We read of a bear with three ribs in its mouth also coming up out of the sea. This represented the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. We also find in prophecy a leopard beast with four heads and four wings representing the kingdom of Greece. And then we read of a great and terrible beast that looks like a dragon with great iron teeth and ten horns. This beast also has a little horn with the eyes of a man. We read of a dragon being cast out of heaven in a war from outer space, the war of the gods. And we also read of a serpent with wings, a fiery flying serpent. Many are the questions that deal with the UFO movement. Numerous sightings have been reported by intelligent and knowledgeable people all over this world of ours. This photograph of a flying saucer was taken in New Mexico in the 1960s. It is supposed to be authentic. Whether it is or not is the question. However, there is a tremendous riddle that revolves around the UFO mystery. Some say there are five types of UFOs. A cherry red flame has been seen at times coming out of the end of some of the UFOs. Today, many books and movies are featuring outer space and the UFO movement. These are some of the books that have been written on the UFO movement. Betty and Barney Hill brought national attention to the UFO movement in 1961 when they told their story of being taken aboard a flying saucer while returning from a vacation trip toward Ashland, New Hampshire. Many sightings of UFOs was reported in the 1960s. A man from England named George King also caused people to be aware of UFOs. He is the head of the Aetherius Society. George King claims that Jesus Christ appeared to him as he came out of a UFO. He told him to tell his story of seeing Jesus and that he would return to this earth in a flying saucer at his second coming. This group believes that Jesus Christ will come from the planet Venus in a flying saucer. On the eastern side of Mexico, near the Guatemalan border, are the remains of an ancient city named Palenque. A pyramid can be seen here that is named the Pyramid of the Inscriptions. For years it was thought that these pyramids were temples and not tombs. In 1969, a Mexican archaeologist discovered an opening at the top of the pyramid 
that led down to a tomb. He noticed some holes in a slab at the top of the pyramid. He had some men help him remove that slab, and he saw a passageway full of rubble that led down into the tomb. After some time, they cleared away the rubble, and as they went down into the base of that pyramid, they discovered something strange. There were skeletons in front of a great slab showing that they had human sacrifices. They also discovered it was not only a temple and a pyramid, but a tomb. As we look at this painting, we can see a sagittal section picturing the stairway going down to the tomb. Now there was something interesting about this tomb because it had a huge slab over the casket. And as we examine the slab, we find a figure carved on that slab. Now some say this is an astronaut taking off to outer space in a rocket ship or a UFO. His hands and his feet are supposed to be on levers. But this is not an astronaut taking off to outer space. This is Pa Cal, the priest king, that was buried in that tomb. They say that the feathers on the back of his headdress actually represent rays from a rocket shot. But they did not understand why these carvings were on that slab. Here we see a jaguar stylized, representing the sun god at night to the ancient Mexican cultures. We also find a tree in the form of a cross. It was called the Seba tree or the immortality tree, the tree that connected heaven and earth for the deceased king. Gods and Devils from Outer Space is a good book. It is written by Eric Norman, and it tells a fascinating story about a police officer named Herbert Shermer. On December 3, 1967, Herbert Shermer was driving in his police car along a lonely road. It was about 2.10 in the morning as he traveled along. A drizzly morning, the animals seemed fidgety, and it seemed like an unusual morning. Off in the distance, he saw blinking lights, and he followed those lights up on a hill. And when he came within a short distance of those blinking lights, he saw it was a UFO. And then he said the beings that came out had on the left side of the chest an emblem, a winged serpent. Now Herbert Shermer was either telling the truth or he was telling a lie. Others have said the insignia of the flying serpent was on the chest of these beings that came out of the UFOs. Now in Isaiah, the 30th chapter in the 6th verse, we read these words the burden of the beast of the south, into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and the old lion, the viper and the fiery flying serpent. This is speaking of Egypt. Now it's interesting to take a trip to Egypt and see if we could find a fiery flying serpent. On the northern part of Egypt are the great pyramids of Giza. And as we go up the Nile to central Egypt, we come to the Valley of the Dead, a place that is called the Valley of the Kings, the Queens, and the Nobles as well. The Nile is the lifeblood of Egypt. Without the Nile, there would be no Egypt. Much of Egypt is like it was centuries ago, yea, even thousands of years ago. They have not changed their ways. As we enter the western side of the Nile, the side that is called the Valley of the Dead, we find temples and tombs. The ancient Egyptians believed that the sun died every afternoon and it came to life every morning. As we go into the tombs of Egypt, we find that the Egyptians lit those tombs with 12 to 14 mirrors in the ancient times. They also demonstrated to people that visit there today. This Egyptian gentleman is reflecting the light that came from the entrance of the tomb off a mirror. 
He bounced that light off the wall, and we see winged serpents. Just like the Bible says, there would be fiery flying serpents in Egypt. No one can deny that these are not winged serpents, snakes with wings. But why snakes with wings when there is no such thing as a snake with wings today? Yet we find them throughout Egypt. When the winged serpents have legs on them, they called them dragons. But there is no such thing as a dragon today. They also painted them on their caskets. And they not only painted them on their caskets, they carved them on their caskets with an undulating body that went the full length of the casket. This represented the immortality of the soul. The ancient Egyptians believed that when they died, their spirit and souls would live on. In central Egypt, we find a very famous valley called the Valley of the Kings. It was here that a famous boy king was buried by the name of King Tut. The western side of the Nile was called the Valley of the Dead. It is a dry, rock-strewn land where the tombs of the dead pharaohs were secreted. King Tutankhamun was a minor king who, it was said, died of tuberculosis at the age of 18 or 19 in the year 1344 B.C. If you go to Egypt today to the tomb of King Tut, you will see this stairway. Imagine what it was like on November 26, 1922. An archaeologist named Howard Carter pulled away the first stone revealing the interior of that tomb that was secreted for over 3,000 years. As Howard Carter gazed at the treasures in that tomb, it must have seemed that other eyes were looking at him as well, eyes that were shrouded in darkness for well over 3,000 years. This was one of the greatest archaeological finds in history, the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb on November 26, 1922. This is what Howard Carter first saw as he entered that tomb. It seemed that grave robbers must have tried to rob some of the jewels and treasures of that tomb but probably were discovered and undoubtedly put to death, and the tomb was sealed once again. We see strange creatures in that tomb, but one of the greatest finds in that tomb was behind a great sealed door. Within that sealed door, Howard Carter discovered the casket of King Tutankhamun. We can only imagine what went through the mind of Howard Carter when they first lifted the lid from this huge casket in this tomb. This is a picture of Howard Carter carefully brushing away the dust of 3,000 years on the outermost casket that covered King Tut. It's interesting to notice that there were three caskets over the body of this boy king. The popes of Rome have three caskets over their bodies as well. This is the head of the outermost casket of King Tut. When Howard Carter saw this head of gold, he shone his light on the face, and he saw the tremendous art of the ancient Egyptian trying to preserve the features of the pharaoh so the spirit and soul, the Ba and the Ka, could recognize that body as they came back into that body once again. This was all built around the teaching of the immortality of the soul. After removing the first casket, Howard Carter saw a second casket, also showing the features of the boy king as he would look in later years. But the most fabulous find of those three caskets was the innermost casket. 
The innermost casket weighed 2,448 and an eighth pounds of solid gold. The head that we see here weighed over 900 pounds of solid gold. The headdress was made in the form of a hooded serpent. King Tut was worshipped as the son of the sun god on earth. The gold on the head of the innermost casket was so bright that when they touched it, it lost some of its luster. There were many artifacts that were discovered in King Tut's tomb. One of these artifacts pictures King Tut on his chariot with a winged serpent behind him. This winged serpent seems to be acting as a protector for the pharaoh of Egypt. But why did the ancient Egyptians use a winged serpent as a protector? One of the most outstanding finds in King Tut's tomb was his golden throne. The armrests on this throne are in the form of two winged serpents. The pharaohs of Egypt were worshipped as the son of the sun god on earth or the life giver. The winged serpents acted as covering cherubs for the pharaoh, but they didn't do much good for King Tut because he was murdered as a young man. Here we have King Tut as the life giver with two winged serpents on either side acting as covering cherubs. As we study the ancient cultures, we find that winged serpents acted as covering cherubs or protectors of the ruling monarchs. Osiris was one of the supreme gods of ancient Egypt. He was called the many-eyed god. Here we see a winged serpent over the god Osiris acting as a covering cherub. Notice this picture carefully. We will refer to it again toward the end of our study. Winged serpents as covering cherubs can be found all over this world. Two stylized winged serpents were in front of a box-like affair as well. These were called the divine serpents by the ancient Egyptians. The art of ancient Egypt was a counterfeit of God's truth. The ancient Egyptian lit those tombs with 12 to 14 mirrors. This is how the artist worked within those tombs. They painted winged serpents with the bodies extending the full length of the room in the tombs. This represented the continual rebirth or the immortality of the soul, and the winged serpent was worshipped as a life giver. In Central America, we find a legend of a winged serpent god. He was called by many names, Quetzalcoatl, Kukulkan, Kukamats, Amaru, and names continue on and on for this winged serpent god. According to the legends, a winged serpent god came from outer space to this earth, set up a kingdom, gave a code of laws, and left and promised to return on a sacred year called Sayakotl. The legends say that he was to return to this earth in a reincarnated state as the great white god and set up his kingdom on this earth once again. There are many ruins throughout Central America. On the eastern side of Mexico is the Yucatan. The upper right-hand corner shows an ancient city that was named Chichen Itza. This is one of the most fascinating ruins to visit in Central America. As one travels to Chichen Itza, one can see great pyramids. One of these pyramids is called the Castillo Ziggurat. There is an interesting thing about this pyramid because the banisters on either side of the stairway are two serpents. It seems that the serpent can be seen everywhere in the religion of the ancient cultures of Central America. A number of years ago, an artist painted this picture of the Castillo Ziggurat. The Temple of the Warriors can be seen at Chichen Itza. At the top of the stairs of this temple, one will find the temple complex. It is very probable that they had human sacrifices 
on the top of this temple. At the top of the temple one can see a reclining figure that was called the Chakmul. The Chakmul was like the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the life giver. He had a plate on his stomach where the hearts of human victims were placed. On either side of the Chakmul were two winged serpents, their heads at the base. The post is the body, and the lintel is the tail. Feathers are carved on the body, and these snakes were called feathered, plumed, or winged serpents. So we find two winged serpents on either side of the life giver in Central America, just like we find in Egypt with the winged serpents on either side of King Tut, the one that was worshipped as the life giver of the Egyptians. This is a basic plan that we find throughout the temple system of Central America. Notice the reclining figure, the Chakmul, called the life giver, and two winged serpents on either side of the so-called life giver of Central America. Notice the plate on the stomach. It was here where the hearts of the victims were placed. Those winged serpents acted as covering cherubs, just as winged serpents acted as covering cherubs for the pharaohs of Egypt. This cannot be just a coincidence. We are beginning to see part of a master counterfeit system of God's truth as it is revealed in His Word. This counterfeit system stems all the way back to ancient Babylon. Great bull courts can be seen throughout Central America. The carvings on the walls of the bull court tell the story of the games that were played. Here we see serpents with wings carved on them that extend the full length of the wall. Two walls in these ball courts. There were fourteen players, seven on each side. They had a rubber ball about nine inches in diameter. The first side to get the ball through the hoop won. The hoops were about eighteen feet up on the walls. We can only imagine what these ball games were like. The people shouting, the players trying as hard as they could to get that ball through the hoop, because the side that lost, according to some authorities, were made sacrifices to the winged serpent god that were carved on each wall of the ball court. The winged serpent god lusting for human sacrifice in Central America. Could it be that the Maya were not the only ones that walked in this temple area to see the magnificent temples and the courts and the great Castillo Ziggurat? Is it possible that Northern Europeans came to the Yucatan sometime between 900 and 1100 A.D. This was the time when the Vikings roamed the uncharted seas. Recent discoveries show that the Vikings landed on the shores of the American continent. It is possible that the Vikings came to Central America long before the time of Columbus. Their ships were beautifully designed and very seaworthy. Let us see what the pagan teachings of the Vikings reveal. Let us travel to the land of the midnight sun, the land of Scandinavia. It is a land of unmatched beauty. The fjords of Norway seem to be nestled like jewels in the midst of snow-clad mountains. Fishermen pull in their nets filled with fish from the deep, cold waters. Even in the land of the midnight sun we can see dragons and serpents in the religion of the Vikings. Outside the city of Oslo in Norway there is a church that the Scandinavians call a Stav church. This church has carved dragon heads on its eaves. They even have made the shingles to look like the scales of a dragon. If one looks carefully, one can see winged serpents carved in the wood 
of this old dragon church of the Vikings when they claim to accept Christianity. In Scandinavia, several ship burials have been found. One of the most famous finds is the Osberg ship that can be seen in a museum in Oslo, Norway. An interesting thing about this ship is that it was made in the form of a serpent. On the prow, the forms of a serpent's head with glowing eyes was carved. The body of the ship formed the body of a serpent, and the stern of the ship ended in the tail of a serpent. Even the shields on the side of the ship were overlapped, appearing like scales of a serpent. In ancient cultures, sails were associated with wings. So when one sees the Osberg ship, the form of a winged serpent appears. Records show that the Vikings actually worshipped a winged serpent god. When the Vikings traveled and traded, they used their serpent ships. But when they went to war, they used their dragon ships. They placed a dragon head on the bow of the ship. And when they came to the different countries, they acted as a dragon. They were destroyers. When people saw the Viking ships coming with those dragon heads, they cried out, Deliver us from the Vikings. The Vikings were demon worshipers, and they destroyed everything and everybody in sight when they came with their dragon ships. Let us go back to Central America, to a place called Tio Tihuacan, outside of Mexico City. It is here that we see some tremendous pyramids, the Great Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon can be seen in Tio Tihuacan. They have a street that is called the Street of the Dead, and there are many strange creatures revealed in the temple system of the ancient Aztec culture. Here we find great dragon heads on their temples, dragons that represented the destroyer. The Orient is a fascinating part of the world. It is truly an ancient land with ancient cultures. Throughout the whole of the Orient, dragons are displayed. Many of the countries of the Orient have rituals in which dragons are used to tell the story of the War of the Gods. This is a beautifully designed dragon. One can see an attractive palace in the city of Bangkok in Thailand. Throughout this palace are attractive temples and strange-looking figures that represent angels that are supposed to scare away the evil spirits. Again, we see the war of the gods, or the powers of good and evil warring against each other, even in this palace and temples in Thailand. Across the street from this palace is a place where they train Buddhist priests. Buddha in the Orient is represented as the life-giver and is worshipped. In this temple we see Buddha with two winged serpents on either side of his body. At the base we see the two heads of the serpents. The tails come together at the top and the wings are in the form of a crescent moon. Once again we see two winged serpents on either side of the life-giver in the Orient as we found two winged serpents on either side of the life-giver in Central America and two winged serpents on either side of the life-giver in Egypt. Winged serpents throughout various parts of the world telling a story that stems back to the beginning of this earth's history. Remember the picture of a winged serpent as a covering cherub in Egypt over the god Osiris the many-eyed God. Now let us go to the Bible to find the answer to the mystery of the winged serpent found throughout the world. During the time of Moses, God told Moses 
to tell the people to make a sanctuary that he might dwell among them. This was a portable temple with an outer court and a tent-like affair with two rooms. In that tent-like affair was a place called the Holy Place and another room that was called the Most Holy Place. In the Most Holy Place was a golden chest called the Ark of the Covenant. On the top of that chest, on a lid that was called the Mercy Seat, were two angels wrought in gold. These angels represented the highest order of angels in heaven that are on either side of the throne of God. One of those angels at one time was named Lucifer the highest of all the angels in heaven. We read in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel that Lucifer was the covering cherub. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. According to the Bible, Lucifer became proud and wanted to be worshipped as God, and then there was a war in heaven. Revelation 12 tells us this, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Here we find two symbols for the devil, a dragon and a serpent. The dragon was a symbol of a destroyer and has come down through the history of this world to represent Satan as a destroyer. This was the war of the gods that we see throughout the different cultures of this world of ours. A dragon and a serpent are both symbols of the devil. When the devil is a dragon, he's a persecutor and a destroyer. Now let's go to the beginning of the study of the winged serpent. In Genesis 3 we read these words, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Notice the serpent in these verses. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The story goes on to tell us that Eve ate of the fruit, and she gave to Adam, and he ate, and this was sin, because they disobeyed God. Now what kind of a serpent was this? In verse 14 it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life." Now this doesn't say that this is a winged serpent, but it alludes to another form of locomotion other than crawling on the earth, because the crawling on the earth is the curse that came to that serpent. Now there's a very interesting study that revolves around this serpent. In Chichen Itza, back in the Yucatan in Mexico, we find on the temple walls the mouths of serpents. And within those mouths we can find human heads. Why were there human heads in the mouths of these serpents? Could it be the study of Genesis 3? how the devil used that serpent as a medium to speak through, a human voice coming out of the mouth of a serpent? Could it be that these ancient cultures tell the story that we read about in the first book of the Bible? Here we see another head coming out of a serpent's mouth, a voice 
a human voice coming out of the mouth of a serpent. When Eve was deceived, that's what she heard. Now we find winged serpents in the art of these ancient cultures. Here we find a stylized winged serpent in Central America with a human head on that body. Could this be the study of Genesis 3? We not only find these human heads on winged serpents in Central America, but we can find them in Egypt as well. Here we see a winged serpent with a human head. No one can deny that that's not a human head on a winged serpent. Why? This, without a doubt, stems back to the great deception in the Garden of Eden. That head represents the voice that came out of the mouth of that winged serpent in the Garden of Eden. An inspired writer wrote these words many years ago. Her name was E.G. White. Satan assumes the form of a serpent and enters Eden. The serpent was a beautiful creature with wings, and while flying through the air, his appearance was bright, resembling burnished gold. Here this inspired writer tells us that that serpent in the Garden of Eden was a winged serpent. Legends in the Orient tell about a winged serpent in the first paradise of this earth. In the Garden of Eden, without a doubt, that serpent through which the devil spoke was a winged serpent. Let us consider this winged serpent in the Garden of Eden. We are told that it was the most beautiful of all the creatures in the garden. The Bible says the most subtle. When sin came through that serpent, it was cast unto the earth and made to feed on the dust of the earth. The most beautiful creature in the garden became the most dreaded. Now we find an analogy with that winged serpent and Lucifer, who was the covering cherub in heaven at one time. Lucifer was the most beautiful of the angels in heaven. And when sin came through Lucifer, Lucifer was cast unto the earth, and the most beautiful creature became the most dreaded. The symbol for the devil was a dragon. That dragon was cast out of heaven like a thunderbolt, and he was cast unto the earth with his evil angels, and the Bible says that he's deceived the whole world ever since. Through the study of the dragon and the serpent and the winged serpent, we read the history of the devil and his deceptions. Some movies tie in the winged serpent with UFOs. Forced to seek a new home, the legion of the winged serpent has selected planet Earth. Why did they mention the winged serpent in this movie entitled Starship Invasions? Is the devil programming the world for his master deception? A rock group called KISS uses a winged serpent in their performance. Why would they use a winged serpent? Their name means knights in Satan's service. This is a symbol of the devil in their act. Remember the story of Herbert Shermer, the police officer that said the emblem of a winged serpent was on the chest of these beings from outer space? Could it be that the winged serpent god, Satan, is behind the UFO movement? We have many movies coming out now, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. We are not alone. Are we alone listening for signs of life? Are there beings from outer space? There is a group today that believes that Jesus Christ is the winged serpent God and that He will come to this earth and set up His kingdom on this earth once again and there will be peace and happiness on the earth when the winged serpent God returns. But the Bible has much to say about the coming of Jesus Christ. He is going to come in the clouds of heaven, we are told. 
Some say the second coming of Christ is mentioned up to 2,500 times in the Bible. Let us read some of the texts that deal with the second coming of Christ. Revelation 1-7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. In Matthew 24, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 25, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. When Jesus comes, the righteous will be caught up into heaven. There is no secret thing about the second coming of Christ. It will be like the lightning shining from the east, even unto the west. Jesus will come with all the holy angels. No one will be able to counterfeit the second coming of Christ. But we are warned that Lucifer, who became the devil, will try to personate Christ's second coming. This is the history of the winged serpent god. The Bible tells us warnings against Satan coming and personating Christ. Satan will touch the earth. Jesus will not touch the earth at his second coming. Satan will appear as an angel of light and will come to different parts of the world claiming to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us read what it says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. In 2 Thessalonians 2, we read, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Satan will work with power and signs and lying wonders, it says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Satan will deceive the majority of this world. He will appear as Christ is pictured in Revelation 1, a beautiful angel of light. He will perform miracles, all signs and lying wonders. He will heal the sick, but he is the great deceiver. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. In Revelation 16 we read these words, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. We are headed toward the great tribulation that the Bible speaks of in the book of Revelation and in Daniel as well. This will be the end of this earth's history. When Jesus comes... This earth will be reeling like the waves of the sea. He will come with the armies of heaven, and he is pictured as riding on a great white horse, symbolically in Revelation 19. He comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. He comes with the armies of heaven, 
all the holy angels. And this will be called the Battle of Armageddon in the Bible. This is when Jesus comes to claim his own. Great hailstones, the weight of a talent, will come down from the heavens, and this will destroy the earth. The earth will reel like the waves of the sea. We are told that when Jesus comes, his vesture will be dipped in blood. This will be Christ's strange work as he comes as King of kings and Lord of lords to destroy the wicked that remain. We are told that the heavens will open as a scroll, as it's rolled together. All heaven will be in commotion. The sun will become black as sackcloth of hair. The moon shall turn to blood, we are told, and the stars shall fall from heaven. Everything will be in commotion. Satan will not be able to counterfeit Christ's second coming. The stars falling from heaven and commotion everywhere on the face of this earth. We are told that the water will turn to blood, the seaports will disappear, and the islands of the sea will disappear as well. Consternation and destruction everywhere. But God will have a people that will be ready to meet him in the clouds. We are told when Jesus comes, every eye shall see him. He comes with all the holy angels. He comes as the lightning shining from the east, even to the west. He comes to claim his own. King of kings and Lord of lords. He is pictured with a sickle in his right hand, ready for the harvest of the righteous. He has a silver trumpet in his left, and when he blows that trumpet, he will shout, Awake, 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 ye that sleep in the dust, and arise. This is the great harvest time of the world, a harvest of the righteous and a harvest of the wicked. The righteous will have eternal life, the wicked eternal death. Which side will you be on, friend, at that time? This is a very serious study, the study of the second coming of Christ and the harvest at the end of the world. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? That is a question that all will ask at that time. Who shall be able to stand? Those that have followed the commandments of God will stand at that time. Those that have rejected God's love and despised His mercy and trampled upon His law will cry to the mountains and the rocks to fall on them, to hide them from the face of Him that sitteth upon the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. Those that have worked for the money of this world and neglected the true meaning of life by serving the Lord Jesus Christ will cast their silver and their gold to the moles and the bats. Those that have lived for the things of this world will perish at that time. The false religious teachers will suffer extremely at that time for leading so many people away from the standard of Christ's righteousness, His Ten Commandment Law. When Jesus comes and blows the trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Friends, if we are faithful, we are going to take a real journey throughout space to the heavenly city. We will be with the redeemed of all ages, with all the holy angels. We will go through the open space in Orion, and we will be with Jesus throughout the endless ages of eternity. Study the Word of God that you might discern truth from error. May God bless us all. Amen.